But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast. In this episode, we journey back to the mid-20th century, a time marked by intense global conflict and unparalleled scientific progress. Our focus is on a single man, standing at the epicenter of an earth-shattering project. His name? J. Robert Oppenheimer. Envision a world at war, nations battling for dominance with science and technology pushed to their limits. In the midst of this turmoil, Oppenheimer is faced with a monumentous decision to lead the Manhattan Project, the initiative that would change the face of warfare and the world forever. We'll trace Oppenheimer's journey, his visionary leadership, his ethical dilemmas, and his decision to spearhead the creation of the first atomic bomb. We'll navigate through the intricate corridors of political intrigue, scientific innovation, and personal tribulations that encompassed this monumental endeavor. Prepare for a journey that explores the dichotomy of human ingenuity and destructive power. We'll consult with historians, analyze personal accounts, and challenge the enduring myths that have shaped our understanding of Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project. So whether you're a history enthusiast, a student, or a seeker of wisdom from the annals of the past, Let's turn back the clock together and set history in motion. Welcome to the nuclear era. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast, where today we'll be talking about the famous Robert Oppenheimer, who is known as the father of the atomic bomb and uh, the star of Christopher Nolan's upcoming film, (laughs) which I know we're all very excited for, um, unofficial sponsor of the podcast. (laughs) So maybe, Richie, I think I can just maybe kick us off here about talking about a little bit about who Oppenheimer is as a person and why he's he's so interesting. And I think where I'm going to start is not so much just on him being, you know, the father of the atomic bomb and being this great scientist, but I think what most people know him for is, you know, the famous quote that he gives after he realizes the destructive power of the atomic bomb and this nuclear arms race that's being created it really shows a man who goes from, you know, being really on top of the world and top of the scientific world to a man who's really struggling with the decisions he made, even though he may think they were the right decisions at the time and still does really having to deal with those consequences. And we'll see as the type of person that he is, how much that really starts to eat at him. And it doesn't really just make a smooth ending to this whole story for him. It's definitely a struggle all the way to up to the end of his life. Well, it's interesting, right? I think just in like popular culture, There's not much else within like the social fabric that is attributed to him outside of the atomic bomb and that particular quote. We've kind of, uh, you know, put him in a neat little box. You know, (laughs) neat might not be the most operative word, but, you know, like a little box essentially where he's the guy that made the atomic bomb that ultimately led to two atomic bombs being dropped in Japan. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting to learn a little bit more about the person and, and and, and the guy behind you know, this kind of massive initiative to create nuclear weapons. Definitely. And I think before we maybe dive into his, you know, bio and everything like that, we should maybe preface to this. The decision we're going to focus on today is not so much the decision to drop the atomic bomb. We we did two episodes on that way back <laughs> um, near the beginning, um, which was ultimately Harry Truman's decision. We're going to be looking more at the decision to actually join the Manhattan Project, lead the Manhattan Project, and really how it was this kind of moral dilemma for for Oppenheimer and, you know, kind of balancing that sense of duty and how that all came together as a very personal choice for him more than a maybe geopolitical choice that, you know, Truman had to make. So just something we want to point out there just so we can kind of make a differentiation. So let's bring Oppenheimer onto the scene here. So he was born in 1904 to a Jewish family in New York City. Um, his father, Julius Oppenheimer, was from Prussia. He immigrated to the United States as a, as a teenager with very little money, not much education, no knowledge of the English language. 
but he was hired by a textile company. And within a decade, he was an executive there, eventually becoming quite wealthy. So he was able to give Robert Oppenheimer the opportunity to go to a private school in New York City, where he completed the third and fourth grades in one year, skipping half of grade eight. So we kind of start to see that there's of course, definitely coming from the father's side, there's definitely was a lack of opportunity coming to the U.S. for new opportunity, but a lot of firepower in in the brains of of his parents and clearly some good genetics when it comes to, <laughs> um, I would just say, IQ. So he basically motors through his, his studies. In his final year, he starts to become interested in chemistry and ends up getting into to Harvard. Um, he actually has to delay his entrance to Harvard for a year because he was actually quite sick. So to help him recover from his illness, his father had his English teacher help out. And so he went to to New Mexico with his English teacher to kind of get away from the city, to kind of get out to nature, classic kind of early 20th century healing, kind of getting well sort of practice. And Oppenheimer fell in with horseback riding, the whole Southwest United States kind of had this really this love for it, especially coming from a place like New York City, it's a very stark contrast. So his love for New Mexico is just important to point out here because it will become quite important later on. But he eventually goes to Harvard where he was originally planning to study physics, but he took a thermodynamics course and kind of gave the, oh, this is interesting. Let's, there's more to this whole physics thing that, that I might like. Flips over to physics and then powers through and graduates within three years. So this is the, I think just to wrap up, he did school very quickly. And I think <laughs> it's very clear that he had a lot of firepower in his brain. So he's at the point now where he's graduated from his undergraduate studies and he's looking now to move into postgraduate work. And this is a really interesting time for physics. So this is what a lot of people would call like the golden age of physics. So if you look at, if you pull up a list of who are the you know top 50 physicists who have ever existed, I would say 80 to 90% of them, are, you're going to find their names and, and their birth years being between like the 1860 and like maybe mm -hmm. 1910, 1920. So for example, you have Enrico Fermi, Niels Bohr, Paul Dirac, Max Planck, and you know the famous Albert Einstein. And that's just a small subset of the type of people that Oppenheimer is going to be crossing paths with. So he writes to Ernest Rutherford, who is again, one of these great physicists of the time. He's working at Cambridge. And he writes to him and wants to come work in his lab. He's invited to go work in the lab, but something Oppenheimer realizes very quickly is he's very clumsy in a laboratory environment. He doesn't really have the <laughs> fine touch to be doing these like highly sensitive experiments. So he ends up moving to the theoretical side of physics, where he lands a position under the supervision of J.J. Thompson. I would just encourage the listeners to look up some of these physicists and the names that we're talking about here, because Ernest Rutherford, you'll see his name around the discovery of how the atoms constructed. I believe J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. It's so like these are not just your, your average shows. Yeah, yeah, right. These are like the upper echelon of, you know, of, of, of physics. Mm -hmm, definitely. So he's he's very smart and he's crossing paths with some of the smartest people that the world had ever seen up to this point. So as he's kind of going through these studies, we start to see Oppenheimer turn from this super genius who just likes the study to more of an antagonistic person. He has this personality starting to develop of kind of a bit of a know-it-all, but also kind of that person, you know, we think of a typical physicist. I almost think of like, if you watch the show, The Big Bang Theory, kind I of like a- I was about to say yeah, Sheldon. Yeah, yeah Kind yeah. of like a Sheldon in a sense. I think a little bit more socially um, <laughs> available in terms of how he's able to interact with people, but definitely has, lives in his books, lives for physics, social cues and all that, or maybe aren't his, aren't his strong suit. <laughs> And he's a little, a little crazy actually here. So there's an interesting story where he develops this really antagonistic relationship with his tutor, who is a few years older than him. So on, he's on vacation with a friend and he tells the friend that he actually left an apple doused with a noxious chemical on his tutor's desks in hope that he would eat it. And I don't know if it was to kill him, but to either cause him some discomfort. Um, and so there was some issues going on with the university authorities were were alerted his parents were brought into it and he was eventually allowed to stay in school but it was kind of a big deal that was kind of hush hush and he only revealed it to a friend years later but again to go to the level of poisoning an apple like disney evil witch sort of <laughs> level of of action so it just, just goes kind to of show you right like the, the what was the saying like the line between genius and insanity is very very yeah. fine very fine definitely that's a great way to put it like he <laughs> He talks to his brother at one point and he basically says, I need physics more than friends. So it's there you go. There you yeah. go. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Right. You know, we, we think of insanity and it's definitely that that person who's 
so introverted, um, you know, living in their own world. And again, that line is so thin. You could jump over that line too far and some, some nasty things could happen. But with Oppenheimer, he was kind of described as this tall, thin chain smoker who often neglected <laughs> to eat during periods of intense thought and conversations. Many of his friends said he had a lot of self-destructive tendencies. So he's definitely this guy who he's in his own world, very introverted, really enjoys what he does, but it seems like he's the kind of guy that really can't turn his brain off when he needs to. And when in those, you know, deep thoughts of concentration, those self-destructive tendencies, there's a lot of, you know, mental health things here before, mm -hmm. you know, really mental health became a thing. And as we'll start to see, depression is definitely something that comes across a lot for, for Oppenheimer. And I think it's kind of, you see a lot with, with people at, you know, this level of genius who are, you know, struggling to find, you know, whether it's purpose and the social elements to their life and really just diving into something so deeply. So that's kind of who we see Oppenheimer being. And he kind of, you know, was moving through these studies and he leaves Cambridge to go work at the University of, it's a German name that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, <laughs> um, to study, um, in basically study in Germany under Max Born, who again, look him up. He's another, um, heavyweight of the physics world at the time. And while he's studying, he meets Werner Heisenberg, Paul Dirac, and Enrico Fermi, who are all great physicists themselves. He was known for being, and this is uh, Oppenheimer, known for being too enthusiastic in discussion, sometimes to the point of taking over seminars. This irritated some of Born's other students so much so that another physicist, she presented a petition to Born with her her signature and a bunch of others saying they were going to boycott the class unless Oppenheimer quieted down. <laughs> <laughs> so Max Born apparently left it out on a desk or left it on Oppenheimer's desk and Oppenheimer read it and eventually got the, got the memo. It did its effect. With all that being said, Oppenheimer finishes up his studies, gets his doctorate of philosophy and physics in March, 1927 at the, the young age of, of 23. So if you think of, you know, 23, 20 he got yeah. his PhD. PhD in physics with oh I feel like such a loser that's amazing. seriously that's insane that is so impressive and it's not like he's just with regular you know he's going to a regular school with just regular physicists these are the cream of the crop this is the peak of the physics world and well, it's interesting toe -to -toe, you right? say that, right? Like, I, I think to one of your earlier points about this kind of being like the golden age of physics, I was listening to a podcast. I don't remember which one, but I think it was Sean Carroll that was on it, mm -hmm. who's a physicist of the modern era. I think his, his sentiment was pretty much kind of along the lines of what you've been saying, Paul, which is like this kind of golden age of physics really was a game changer in terms of our understanding of, of, of physics as it is today. And I hope I don't misquote him, but... I think the sentiment that he was sharing was things haven't changed that much since this kind of window, of, uh, these, these great physicists that we're talking about today, like the amount of work that they attributed to our understanding of modern physics, it was world changing in terms of what we knew before and after them. But since then, it hasn't changed all that much. Like it's been very incremental where it seems like you know, these physicists, you know, Oppenheimer and, and, and the people that he was working with. Like the shift was monumental in many ways. And since then, you know, we've had some improvements and some incremental changes and in improvements in understanding, but nothing like what happened in this particular era. Definitely. And I, yeah, I would I definitely agree with that sentiment. And I think that the one thing that you kind of saw at this time was experiments were starting to, like the experimental tools that existed were starting to get to a level where people, A, understood the math and the science behind it that had been built on, you know, since going back to Newton and, and some of those guys coming up through like guys like Maxwell. And then you got to this point where like the experiments were starting to confirm a lot of these theories that were coming out. And then it was the ability to communicate as well was much easier. And a lot of you hear like Einstein would be writing letters to his colleagues all over the world and getting letters back where hundred years before that, you know, things couldn't really happen. And then we look at today, the challenge now is with a lot of this theoretical stuff is how do you test it? Because, you know, we're talking about black holes and we're talking about Quantum other universes. Yeah, yeah, all that yeah, kind yeah. of crazy stuff, right? That you're not setting up a laser and shooting it at something and being like, oh, there it is. You're building mile long particle accelerators and smashing oh, atoms yes, together. With the Large Hadron Collider, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So stuff like that. So yeah, it's definitely was this, definitely was this golden age and it definitely set the stage for some of these great minds to really flourish. Like all the, all the chips were down for, for these people. And then it kind of turns into, you know, war starts to come in, into play as well. 
and you start to see the shift from general scientific curiosity to building weapons of war starting in, in the First World War and then, as we'll see, with Oppenheimer into the Second World War. Um, but before we get into that, we can talk a little bit about what happens to Oppenheimer after he gets his PhD. And it's important because there's a lot that kind of happens in Oppenheimer's life before he gets to the Manhattan Project. And it's important to understand why he was actually picked to run the Manhattan Project. And we see a little bit here of some similarities when we talked about von Braun. We talked about von Braun as being not the great, the smartest scientist, not the smartest engineer, but really good at managing people. I, don't, I wouldn't say Oppenheimer is like... A, the same in terms of like wasn't a you know one of the top scientists and physicists. He definitely was on the higher end than someone like von Braun, but definitely understood the ability of getting really smart people together and and having them work together. And he also had that charisma and was able to to bring people together. So he was awarded a National Research Council fellowship at the California Institute of Technology, which is also known as Caltech. He was splitting his time between Harvard and Caltech, the late twenties. You know, two of them probably the most prestigious schools uh, nowadays. So again, you can see where a lot of those seeds were set. And one of the things he would really push was postdoctorate studies at, at Caltech and really bringing in a lot of students to help promote physics and, and the research of it in the United States was making you know the United States the hotbed for a lot of this scientific research. But again, this is where we see Oppenheimer's awkwardness and just, I, I don't want to assume that he was a, a bad person but there's some weird things that he did. So I'll just go through a few of them here. So he became close friends with a fellow he was researching, but he very weirdly asked the man's wife to go to Mexico with him on vacation, which she was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Thus ending the relationship between the two scientists. So it's like, does he not understand the social cues or is he just a bit of a jerk and is trying to he's, steal he's people's wives? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So a little bit of weird stuff and we'll see a little bit more of that as we, we move through his That's life. But some fascinating um some other kind of crazy thing that happened with him was he was invited to give a technical talk in the netherlands problem was he didn't speak dutch so he decided to just learn dutch in six weeks and then go give the speech and everyone was like wow your dutch is so good so there's a little bit of nuance here because both his parents are native german speakers so would have spoken german to him at home and german and dutch do have a lot of similarities so it's not like a brand new language for him but a new language in six weeks to the level where you can give detailed scientific talks there's something to that yeah, hundred percent. That's yeah. The the amount of accolades. This is interesting because like I'm hearing this all for the first time, and my mm -hmm. impression of this guy, you know, it, it it's it's funny because I I think back to other episodes where we've kind of talked about this kind of creative genius and about people who are, you know, almost obsessive compulsive about what they do, yeah. and they kind of you know they they teeter this line very finely, some not so finely, <laughs> in terms of like you know, how good they are at their particular niche skill or job. Um, I'm definitely getting the impression that he is one of a kind in terms of his mental faculties and intellectual capabilities to be able to do what he's doing. But I think the trade off also what I'm hearing is that the um, social skills or social cues might not have fully formed <laughs> while he was focusing on his physics and education. Definitely. Yeah, he's He's definitely a bit overshadowed, I think, from some of his scientific work. So from what I've looked up, he wrote a paper on the existence of something called a positron, which is the antimatter equivalent of an electron, which is like was a big deal. But again, it was this golden age of physics, and there's all these Nobel Prizes being released for all of these things. And I think he kind of got lost in the shuffle. And there was a few physicists who wrote kind of later in life that if he had lived longer and was able to dig into a bit more research he probably would have won a Nobel Prize, but he never did. So he definitely does get overshadowed in that compared to, again, you're dealing with Albert Einstein's in, in his heyday and, you know, all these other great people that we've mentioned. So, yeah, he's definitely one of a kind in that sense, but definitely overshadowed just a bit by, by the time that he lives in. So that kind of ends his kind of educational piece. He spends a lot of time at Caltech and really builds out Caltech and Berkeley and the kind of the University of California um, physics and Post grad studies program and is able to help grow that program a lot to kind of make it again one of the hotbeds for new grads and, and post grad students coming in to do research. But I'm going to flip quickly here to just his personal life before we get into talking about the Manhattan Project and him getting involved in that. So during the 20s, Oppenheimer admits that he really didn't know what was going on in the world. He claimed he didn't <laughs> read newspapers or listen to the radio. 
He only learned of the Wall Street crash of 1929 while he was on a walk with a friend, but that was six months after the crash. And he's the kind of guy where you'd say, would you live under a rock? And, you know, the biggest stock market crash ever. And he's just hearing about it on a casual walk with a friend. So he's a little bit un- unplugged, I guess, is the word I could give him. Uh, so then we get to 1934 and Oppenheimer starts to change his tune here where he starts to become interested in politics and international affairs and specifically with hearing about physicists, specifically Jewish physicists fleeing Nazi Germany. So he actually took a, he would take a 3% of his annual salary, which is about a hundred dollars, which equates to about $2,000 today um, for two years to help support these German physicists fleeing Nazi Germany. So he's starting to see you can kind of start to see like this is the science that he loves so much is being threatened by geopolitical matters and, and things like that. So he starts to get involved with that. He starts to help with, there's a big strike on the West coast. He comes in and helps protest on behalf of the workers. So he starts to get into this point of, you know, workers rights, fascism is bad. So naturally it's the thirties Communism is a very, very popular thing. And he starts to get involved with some people who are very, very left-leaning. But he never becomes an official member of the Communist Party, but he deals with a lot of people who are part of the Communist Party. And this is something that will come back to bite him in the butt later in life as McCarthyism and other kind of the Red Scare starts to come to come around. Um, he was investigated by the FBI multiple times, but never said, never was found to be an official member of the Communist Party. But he did say he agrees with some of the things that the Communist Party stands for, but would never actively join the party and always kind of said he was a uh, advocate for democracy in the United States and feels part of that. But Again, very, very close to people like that. He was dating someone at some point that was part of the Communist Party. So again, very close. And then he had another little scandal where he met a girl named Kitty. He he slept with her after a party. But in, in the summer of 1940, she was staying with Oppenheimer at his ranch in New Mexico. Again, this is a married woman. So she finally asked her husband for a divorce when she found that she was pregnant with Oppenheimer's child. The... Husband refused, um, and then she was somehow able to get a, a divorce somewhere else. Long story short, she's able to leave her husband and take Oppenheimer as her fourth husband. So a little bit of a history with her. Oh, geez. And they eventually have um, two kids that were born um, during the war. So again, his social norms of, of finding people in his life, not the most straightforward, breaking up relationships. Um, and then again, I we don't know for sure if this is just has no idea how social cues work. I I would like to think he does just because he's able to lead the Manhattan projects, run Cal, parts of Caltech. He's got to know how things work. Maybe he is just a bit of a jerk. I don't know. But there's a lot of evidence here that's that's kind of going against them. Well, one of the things that kind of stood out, it's interesting, like this kind of being like tangential to communism, you know, like being around yeah. it, but not really in it. It's interesting because he's at, you know, these very prestigious universities, which are often very Mm -hmm. left-leaning. It's interesting that he never had any real inkling to learn about current events or politics, you know, while he's at these prestigious universities. Mm -hmm. I think that really goes to show how inundated and focused and narrow-minded he was, you know, in his... uh, in his in a singular focus of, of physics and physics alone um, definitely yeah it's interesting yeah I, I didn't really consider that but it seems i think it kind of actually just probably solidifies or more like crystallizes what we're kind of thinking about him already which is that yeah. he really only cared about a few things and out of those few things he probably really only cared about one <laughs> mm-hmm. seriously and i think the kind of the, the cross that i'm seeing here is he doesn't really become interested in anything outside of his day-to-day work until you know, physicists are being threatened in Nazi Germany. And I'm sure there's a connection himself being Jewish and the things going on in Nazi Germany. There's maybe more of a personal touch to it for people who come from the same background as him, but also is this a threat to his physics? Is this a threat to study, you know, to mm-hmm. the world advancing physics? And, you know, he has friends in Germany as well. He he worked there. He, he studied there. Um, it starts to become a little bit more personal for him. But yeah, it is interesting how he does literally live under a rock when he's in kind of the hotbed of you know, more left-leaning politics and, and flirting with the communist kind of movement. It is it is fascinating that it does take him until, you know, 1934, because he's been in California for a decade at this point. So it is it is quite interesting. And I think just the last point on him, um, I have a point here that I thought was interesting. 
His father, like we said, became very wealthy and ended up leaving the equivalent in today's dollars of $8.2 million um, to his kids as part of an inheritance. And wow. apparently Oppenheimer, the first thing he did was he changed his will to leave all of his money when he died to the University of California, the different schools that they have uh, throughout the state to help pay for for graduate studies. So again, single-minded focus in the sense of, I have all of this money, I should just give it to people who want to study physics and want to push education forward. So I'd be very curious to see if someone ever did a study on like the, that kind of money and back in those days, how much a kid did to kind of grow the University of California system to where it is today. So super fascinating stuff. Um, but now we're kind of getting to the point, Richie, where I think maybe we can flip it over to you to learn a little bit more of not so much him joining the Manhattan Project, but you know, why do we need a nuclear bomb maybe to begin with? <laughs> yes. So I think it's funny because I think a lot of people either have heard or are in some way, shape or form aware of the Manhattan Project and how it ultimately led to, you know, the creation of the first two atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan by the US. But it's a very interesting program in terms of how the interplay between the US, the United Kingdom and Canada, like, there's a lot of cool, interesting facts about it. So, you know, at the highest level, the Manhattan Project was a top secret research and development program undertaken during World War II by the U.S. There was assistance, and I didn't actually know too much about this, from the U.K. and Canada. Its primary goal was to develop the first atom atomic bomb, which obviously, as we know, was one of the most powerful and unprecedented weapons that could potentially end the war at the time. The project was initiated in 1942, and it lasted until 1946. So if we go a little bit deeper, um, you know, the name Manhattan Project is actually derived from the Manhattan Engineer District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which was responsible for managing the project. It was led by General Leslie Groves, a military engineer, and Robert Oppenheimer, a physicist who we've talked about, who was appointed as the scientific director. And again, to your previous point, Paul, this project brought together some of the most brilliant minds in physics, chemistry, and engineering. Uh, we've already mentioned a couple of these, but Enrico Fermi, Richard Feynman. In terms of the research and development that took place, so obviously this is a massive initiative, like absolutely massive initiative. How do you keep something like this under wraps <laughs> is always my question, right? So the research and development took place at multiple sites across the U.S., including their primary facility at Los Alamos in New Mexico, where the first atomic bomb was designed and constructed. Ultimately, the Manhattan Project resulted in two types of atomic bombs, the uranium-based bomb Little Boy and the plutonium-based bomb Batman. The first successful test of the atomic bomb, codenamed Trinity, took place on July 16th, 1945 in New Mexico. The explosion at the time, I think, left everyone shocked in terms of what they had actually accomplished in terms of the destructive power of atomic weapons and marked a turning point, you know, I think for the human civilization as a whole. Not to sound dramatic, but I, I truly believe it's one of those kind of pivotal moments in human history where things are going to drastically change after this particular event. And just like, uh, I guess, two points kind of loop back to in terms of the roles that the UK and Canada played. So I wasn't too familiar about this, but I thought this was really interesting. Obviously, we're in Canada, so I thought that would uh, be a little <laughs> neat little tidbit that we could share. So the UK and Canada played actually pretty pivotal roles in the Manhattan Project in terms of providing you know scientific expertise, resources, and collaboration through the development of the atomic bomb. So early research and collaboration, the UK was one of the first countries to explore the potential of nuclear energy for military purposes. Again, British scientists such as uh, Ernest Rutherford, James Chadwick, Sir John Cockcroft made significant early discoveries in nuclear physics, kind of laid the groundwork for the Manhattan Project. Um, before the establishment of the Manhattan Project, the UK had its own atomic bomb research program called Tube Alloys, really became the forerunner of kind of like this atomic you know, military research program, other scientific contributions, you know, as a part of like the broader collaboration, science, uh, several British scientists had joined the Manhattan Project and continued to kind of move the work forward, contributing to the development of the atomic bomb. This was actually super interesting, too. So in terms of resources and facilities, Canada actually played quite a major role here. So Canada provided essential resources, such as the uranium ore, which was vital for the production of the nuclear fuel. 
the country also hosted research and production facilities such as Chalk River Laboratories in Ontario, which focused on the production of heavy water, which is a key component in nuclear energy reactors, and the Montreal Laboratory, where research on nuclear reactor design and plutonium extraction was actually conducted. So essentially, it was the collaboration between the US, the UK, and Canada in the Manhattan Project was essentially critical to its success and exemplified kind of this you know, close scientific and political cooperation among the allied powers during World War II. Something that I'll just mention here too, about when I first started learning about this, you know, you think it's this, they stuck a bunch of really smart scientists in Los Alamos and they're writing on a whiteboard and doing a bunch of math. And then just in the backyard, they threw together a quick bomb because they knew, <laughs> you know, they took some uranium. Oh, we figured it out. But you really, as you were kind of describing, this is an industrial operation more yes, than exactly. a scientific operation. So yep. some interesting things that I found out was about the two bombs, so uranium and plutonium. The first is plutonium doesn't exist in nature. You need to synthesize it in some way. You need to have these really industrial level, not centrifuges, maybe it's centrifuges. Anyways, these very large um, devices to convert different elements into plutonium. And then it's incredibly radioactive. So you, you have to, you know, there's a whole piece to how you transport it and store it. Handle and then, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And then with uranium, there's two isotopes that are pretty typical for uranium. So you have uranium-238 and uranium-235. 235 is what you want to make a bomb because it can sustain a chain reaction way better than 238 can. However, uranium-238 is, if you pull some uranium out of the ground, 99 point something percent of that uranium will be 238. So you need to separate out all the 235 because if you throw 238 in, your chain reaction won't be sustained and your bomb won't work or your reactor won't work. So there's these massive, massive industrial areas all over the U.S. that are trying to synthesize down and get what you would call like weapons-grade uranium. And that's what they're trying to do. So, yeah, it's much more than just sticking a bunch of smart physicists and engineers together, which it absolutely was a huge piece. But there's also like an industrial level to it, which is where we see the U.S. really spread their wings during World War II has become this industrial power. And then one last thing I f- was always an interesting thing I found about Canada is the heavy water design that they used mm-hmm. to do. After the war, Canada had all this heavy water lying around, and they were like the world expert on how to make heavy water. And Canada didn't want to make a nuclear weapon, so they're like, we sh- what are we going to do with all this stuff? They desi- decided to design their own nuclear reactor which is actually based on heavy water. So if you go to any of the nuclear reactors in Ontario or across Canada, they're all called CANDU reactors, which Mm -hmm. uses heavy water, which is different than the reactors you'd see in like in the U S or the UK. And I think it's been exported to some other countries as well. So that's a cool thing that kind of comes all the way back to this smaller piece of the Manhattan project, essential, but small. And it's kind of changed the way like just nuclear energy has worked in, in Canada, you know, for 70 plus years, which I thought was always just a cool little timbit of how Canada not only was involved, but it kind of shaped things going forward. Well, I think it's interesting though, right? I think it's a byproduct of this broader industrial project. And I, and you know, I, the phrase military industrial complex <laughs> is like so beaten and overused, but I think if anything, this is probably the right place to use it because this is very much the, you know, military potentially scientific industrial complex at play here. And we're seeing byproducts of that that still, you know, have reverberations to our day to day. And I think to your point about like this kind of industrial scale of what's going on, this is the kind of part that kind of fascinated me about this project was, you know, it's not as simple as just locking a bunch of physicists in a room <laughs> and saying, yo, make me a bomb. No, it's it's much more than that, right? And I, the structure of the Manhattan Project is what kind of... Uh, you know, really piqued my curiosity because my thought process going into this was, you know, we know a lot about the output of the, of the Manhattan Project. You know, we know what happened. The bombs were made, they were dropped, the war came to an end. But how did that project actually get executed from an operational perspective? And I think this is where the conversation is usually kind of, you know, lacking in detail or nuance. So the Manhattan Project was structured with multiple layers of security and compartmentalization to ensure secrecy and protect classified information. So there's a number of measures that were implemented to minimize the risk of information leaks, you know, espionage and mm. or sabotage. Um, some of these key elements, you know, we'll talk about a little bit, one being compartmentalization. So the project itself was divided into numerous smaller research and production units each kind of working on very specific tasks or components of the overall program. Workers were generally only informed of 
these specific tasks, tasks that we were, they were responsible for. And they weren't given any information about the broader context of the goals or the projects. So this division of labor essentially allowed, you know, knowledge to be contained and siloed very effectively. And it helped prevent any single individual from having a complete understanding of the project and thus, you know, minimizing risk of accidental or intentional leaks. And you have like this idea of site isolation. So research and production facilities were spread across the U.S., often in very remote or secluded locations, again, to reduce the risk of espionage and or sabotage. Uh, obviously, the primary research facility was at Los Alamos. It was chosen for its isolation and natural barriers. Workers at these sites were often required to live on site, again, which further limited contact with the outside world and reduced the possibility of any potential leaks. And then you're talking about super strict security measures too. So at all project sites, you had extensive security measures, physical barriers such as fences and guard check posts, as well as surveillance and monitoring personnel. Background checks obviously connected on all employees. Security clearances of the highest magnitude were required to access any type of information. Communication was tightly controlled. Code names are being used, cover stories, censorship of mail and phone calls. There's a lot of thought here behind you know the scope and magnitude of this to, to require this level of secrecy to ensure that nothing gets out. Because obviously, you know, it's a race at this point in time. You know, the Germans want a nuclear weapon. The Russians probably want a nuclear weapon. Everyone wants a nuclear weapon. They can't risk any iota of information leaking because it could literally jeopardize the result that they're hoping for in the war if the Germans get a head start or get something that could help propel their program faster and farther than the U.S. program. I feel really for the families that actually got like, like living on Los Alamos, like at the base, and every day their husband or their wife comes home and they're like, you know, how was your day at work? And they just could say, good. What'd you do? I can't tell you. For like three years and then probably decades after until, you know, most of this stuff comes out. But you're right, just it's a total level lockdown. And I find it interesting that someone like Oppenheimer was even chosen just based on his, even the flirt, the flirting with communism, whether he wasn't a communist at all, yeah. just seems with that level of security. It was like, why even, why even make the risk? And I think, I think that's where Groves came in and being the leader of the entire project really did see something in Oppenheimer. One thing I read was he said that Oppenheimer had an overwhelming ambition. He seemed like he was just so driven and Groves is like, that's precisely what we need. So I guess, yeah, it comes, results can, can trump some safety concerns and some risks. And again, the FBI did investigate him a bunch of times, but just based on everything you were describing, it's like, why, why even risk it? Why this guy? Yeah. yeah why this guy? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a good segue, actually. I guess, you know, we're looking at the decision of, of Oppenheimer leading the project and understanding his intentions or rationale behind it. I guess before we get into like the, like the, the analysis of the decision itself, Something that I was curious about was how aware was Oppenheimer of the intentions of the Manhattan Project, right? Like, was he one of these scientists who were just handling like, you know, a component, maybe a, a more major component of the project? Or did he have an overview of what was going on? Based on what I read, he was very well aware <laughs> of the purpose and goals of the Manhattan Project. He was a scientific director, which meant he had the context, the background, and the understanding of what the impetus was and what they were driving towards. He played a central role in the development of it. He was responsible for overseeing the research, design, and construction of the bomb. And, you know, he ultimately, to your previous point about like kind of this, this emphasis and focus he had on collaboration, bringing people together, you know, he assembled a team of the most brilliant scientists and engineers <laughs> in the world to work on the project at Los, Am at Los Alamos in New Mexico. I guess before we get into the decision about why he did it, I think this is kind of the other thing. So was he aware? Yep. I can confidently say yes. <laughs> he was aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Why did he do it? And this kind of brought some memories back from Warner Von Braun, right? In terms of this scientific curiosity, this hunger for knowledge, this thirst to create something innovative and new and you know, in, in the pursuit of scientific progress, which I think is a sentiment that is such a double-edged sword for people like Oppenheimer, right? He is a renowned physicist who obviously is so passionate and so focused on being the best at his craft. Mm -hmm. 
how could he say no to this? Right? Like, why did he do it? I think, you know, I think the biggest one to me is that just for the sake of scientific curiosity and progress, he said yes. Mm -hmm. And then you layer on the additional, you know, details that you provided about his growing concerns for international affairs, what's going on in Germany, how Jewish people are being treated, uh, Jewish physicists, you know, what's what's at stake here? I think you kind of layer those two together. I think that to him probably justified the means, right? For sure. In terms of why he did it. Yeah, definitely. And like some research that I did as well echoes that a lot with this sense of duty. He wrote to a friend basically saying that the task at hand is primarily the development in time of war of a military weapon of some consequence. Like it's just the way he kind of talks there of like the task at hand. It's this, this is what needs to be done. And like you were saying, very, very anti-fascist really wants to defeat Germany and, and wants to crush them and make sure that the sick things coming out of that, that country can't, can't get much farther around the world. But I do think there is a sense of duty to his country as well. And I think, again, it is very prevalent at the time where people are signing up for the military, you know, want to do their part. This is his way to do his part. And there's a level too that some people are more speculating, I would say, but there's a level of pride and legacy building here. I think for him, definitely with the communist sides of things, the FBI investigating him, people not fully trusting as he committed to to the United States. If he can pull this off, no one's going to question his loyalty. We'll see that that's unfortunately is not the case later down the line. But for a short period of time, he's you know he's the this hero who really brings an end to to the war and saves millions and millions of American lives. But there's definitely some ambition there. I think it's more than just, oh, I'm going to do my duty and then I'm going to move on. I think there's, I'm going to get my name stamped in the history books. And again, I wouldn't blame him. You know, we all all want to leave some sort of legacy behind. A guy like him being surrounded with all these juggernauts of science and physics and seeing that the legacy they're going to leave, who wouldn't want a piece of that? So yeah, I think for him and like why he made the decision, I think, yeah, definitely that that duty piece, I think, is a big, bigger piece of it. But then we come back to this, I wouldn't say pacifist views of him, but definitely a person who's so invested into like his studies and everything and, and wants to do of these kind of things, but definitely has this maybe softer quality about him where I like I don't see him as a person who, who likes war and loves war. And I kind of delve into that a little bit more. And one thing that I found that he was kind of thinking was if we create this bomb, He's now understanding a little bit more about geopolitical affairs. He understands that a few countries are going to have these weapons and they're going to have so much control over world affairs. They can bend other countries to their will or put them in place just by the threat of nuclear weapons. And he almost has this dream of, could this mean the end of war as we know it? Could this be the last major war that we'll ever see? And to an extent, he's kind of right. We didn't have another world war. For now, fingers crossed. Yeah, I was say, fingers crossed. Yeah, right. <laughs> knock, knock on some wood there. But I think there's a, definitely an, an elegance to kind of his maybe a romantic thinking of if we do this, we could stop war forever. So I think he understands where this could go. But I think yeah, duty is probably the thing I would say that, that comes to the top here when it comes to why he did this. Yeah, I think, yeah, before we double down on uh, kind of our decision analysis, mm-hmm. One of the things that I wanted to look up to was just this kind of idea about the essentiality of the Manhattan mm. Project. Was this essential? Obviously, you have the perceived threat from the from Nazi Germany, right? Like that is who you're trying to ensure does not get the leg up on you. Same with Japan. And obviously, you don't know what you don't know, right? This is this is the reality of of wartime decision making. You have to go on the information that's available to you. I guess at the time, there was a genuine concern that Germany was developing its own atomic bomb, which we know they were, you know, they were developing rockets, they were developing atomic bombs, or they were at least trying to develop atomic bombs. Um, So the fear of Nazis possessing such a devastating weapon, you know, obviously is going to push the US and its allies to pursue their own research at an accelerated rate to make sure they're not, you know, second uh, to this party, because you, you definitely don't want to be second here. In hindsight, looking at the archives, looking at the historical research, we can say quite confidently that Germany's nuclear program was not as advanced as they had initially feared when it came to their development of an atomic bomb. But obviously that information, you know, was not available right. to the allies during the war. And you obviously cannot <laughs> operate under the <laughs> pretense that maybe they're, you know, that they're not going to. I guess you would have to operate under the assumption that 
they are ahead of you and we have to get there first. Right. Yeah. And then this, the Soviet threat, which is always yep. there. Always. Yeah. Um, just thinking where we should go next here, Richie, we have, should we go into his, you know, his famous quote, maybe a little bit on kind of his thoughts, maybe it might be a yep. next. All right. So let's go there. So Oppenheimer's known for this very famous quote that he said in an interview years later. So kind of part of the reason I think everyone gets so interested in Oppenheimer is there's this very clear, I don't want to say regret, but also these like really tough feelings that he has to creating the, the bomb and the all the people that died and how it changed the world forever. And he has this famous quote that he says in an interview, thinking back to when the Trinity test was was launched and everybody realized what they created. He said, we knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So it's heavy, right? It's this man reflecting on, you know, a part of his life where he's definitely someone who's got this spiritual side where he's very connected to Hindu, um, the religion and, and the scripture as well. And I think part of that is just, you know, a few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent, you know, and then coming to saying, I've become death, the destroyer of worlds, is a very, very interesting quote. And I have just a few points here on what that actually means, because when I kind of heard it was, and I think it's a bit of a, when you hear the surface of it, it's just kind of simple of, oh, I am, um, I become death being like, I've, I've created something that will destroy the world and, and go from there. But it's actually very interesting kind of as you dig deep into like what the scripture actually means. Um, it's, it's a really interesting story and it kind of gives us a little bit more insight into why Oppenheimer chose that quote and why he was thinking that. So the, this Hindu scripture um, centers around a great warrior named a w- great warrior prince named Arjuna and his charioteer named Lord Krishna, which is an incarnation of Vishnu. Um, so he's facing an opposing army that's containing friends and relatives and Arjuna is torn. But Krishna teaches him about a higher philosophy that will enable him to carry out his duties as a warrior, irrespective of his personal concerns. This is known as a dharma or a holy duty. So we can already start to see the relationship with Oppenheimer here, where he has a duty to do, even though the the outcome is quite dire. Um, if you know, if within the wrong hands or the, the all the lives that are going to be lost when the weapon is actually used. Something that's interesting in the scripture, the word death, as Oppenheimer uses it is more directly translated to world destroying time, which in Hinduism, they have this like nonlinear concept of time. So kind of the thought of reincarnation and, you know, death becomes leads into new life. So the character Arjuna doesn't see what he does as a bad thing because the people who are dying are just going to be reborn again. And so he can kind of see that element a little bit on kind of what Oppenheimer's seeing because he doesn't see, he sees life as very linear. And then there's a, a meaning to the quote of Oppenheimer says is that this character Arjun of whatever he does, doesn't matter because the hands are going to be in the divine. He says he's a soldier. He has a duty to fight the, basically the divine God will determine who lives and who dies, but he's technically unattached from the results. So he's getting to this point where we see Oppenheimer doesn't have this extra level of going to the divine to take on responsibility where he takes it all on himself. So we can kind of see there's a bit of a relationship here with this duty and responsibility piece. Oppenheimer is able to understand, okay, this is the duty that I need to do, but the ultimate responsibility is something that he's going to have to take on. And the text, this Hindu text also kind of talks about that, you know, you should do what your duty is, but you should never let your mind not understand what's happening. You should be able to reflect on it and, and take responsibility for those actions. But this character is able to push a little bit onto the divine. And I thought there was an interesting parallel with someone like Joan of Arc, for example, where Joan has this duty and then this responsibility that she takes on, but she's also kind of able to throw a little bit off onto God. It's like, God has given me this responsibility. Oppenheimer doesn't really have that. He takes the responsibility on himself and it really weighs on him because he's not able to flip it off and say, oh, well, God told me to do this or this was a divine thing. So it's not really on me. This is all on this divine, whatever it might be. And so we can really see when he's talking about it, that 
how this whole quote kind of comes back to this whole element of do your duty, take responsibility for it, but he's unable to take on that last part and push off some of that responsibility onto somebody else. And so I think the quote has a lot more of a deeper meaning to what we see on the surface, but I think it really goes to show what Oppenheimer was thinking and really what he was struggling with ultimately. Yeah, I think it's so easy to take that statement at surface level because it it makes sense, right? You hear it, you understand the context of what he did, how he feels responsible for it. We see the death and destruction as a result of what ultimately happened. Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the bombs being dropped. It's so easy to stop there, right? And I, I would assume most people are not familiar with Hindu scriptures and the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> that, you know, there doesn't require any more analysis. But I think when you take it that that layer deeper, you know, and I think it's probably a good segue into like the like the more specific decision analysis from our perspective. But you can see what he's driving towards, which is this this sense of duty, this endeavor that he is kind of propelled to do because he sees that he's fighting for, you know, potentially a just cause to ensure that, you know, the U S and the allies remain victor over this kind of evil superpower that is threatening the world order. For sure. Yeah. And I think before we get into the decision, there's just one last piece here that I want to touch on just after his, he can, you know, he makes this quote after the war, but there's a few things that are happening to him that are really important to understand of a, he's dealing with all of this responsibility of actually creating the bomb, but then he's also dealing with issues within the government itself. So in 1953, he was he still had his security clearance. He basically found out that the U.S. was trying to build a hydrogen bomb, which is like a nuclear bomb on a way, way higher level of destruction. And he basically comes out and is an advocate of nuclear disarmament, doesn't want the U.S. to build a hydrogen bomb. He said, look, we did it once. We don't have to do it again. He gets called into a security hearing where he's being accused of being a communist and selling secrets to the Russians and all these things. And like, remember, this is seven to eight years out from basically saving millions of American lives, being an American hero. And now he's being you know dragged through the mud and essentially through what a lot of people would say is a witch hunt. And so he is actually stripped of his security clearance and his contract as advisor to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission was canceled. So this is just a huge, huge slap in the face to everything that Oppenheimer did. And so I, I come back to this quote a lot and just thinking of the weight that is on his shoulders. And now people who are supposed to be like, yeah, we're all part of this. We all made a decision together. Don't, don't give him really any support into that. Fortunately, though, the Federation of American Scientists immediately come to his defense, basically, again, calling it a witch trial and basically trying to say, they're just, you know, they're just trying to have a scapegoat for all this McCarthyism and everything that's going on and the Russians getting a nuclear weapon and all these kind of things. But fortunately, when Lyndon Johnson becomes president, he presents Oppenheimer with the Enrico Fermi Award for atom- uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, basically saying, we messed up. We honor you for what you did. So he was thankfully able to get that before he died uh, three years later of throat cancer. It's a kind of just a sad and there's a lot of people kind of describe his life of you know, it has the highest of highs, you know, winning the war for the U.S. and then just falls right off a cliff and to almost like a comes a bit of a tragedy at this point. So it's a bit of a sad end to to his life where he's not really able to continue on with kind of the work that he was doing and is essentially dragged through the mud. But yeah, it's a bit of a, a sad kind of end to his legacy. But I think it can't be stated the, the things that he was able to accomplish, which I think, yeah, let's maybe we should get into a bit of decision here. So I think Richie, maybe first thing I'm interested in is as we've seen this, I think we've talked a little bit about the why and how he did it, but I, I'm trying to think more about like the difficulty of this decision. Was this a hard decision for him? My first gut reaction is not really. I think it was that sense of duty was there, but when I think of him after the war and I can see that the type of person that he was, and I th- would like to think he understands the type of person that he was how he would be ever able to deal with this from a moral standpoint. Did he just push that aside and just say, forget about it? I'm, I'm trying to juggle the two and I'm, I'm kind of maybe struggling with a little bit to say like, yeah, this was a no brainer for him or was he just pushing down those feelings and just decided to get to work? Yeah, that's a, I, yeah. I think it's twofold. I think, I think initially 
if you look at the context and the backdrop, you, we've already talked about this kind of scientific endeavor, you know, this hunger and thirst for scientific progress. Um, you have the context of the war and the Nazi threat. And then you have to balance it with, you know, ultimately the moral and ethical concerns of, con of, of, of creating such a weapon and then ultimately the legacy and consequences of it, right? Like it, it gets quite complicated. I think this is probably one of the more complex and difficult <laughs> decisions we've looked at. Um, the way that I would frame it, at least like in my mind, would be, I think at the onset for him to kind of decide to lead the project probably wasn't a very difficult one concerning like <laughs> if you look at solely on the scientific endeavor and the context of the Nazi threat. I think it's a pretty dis easy decision. I think nine times out of 10, he's going to say yes to leading the project. I think the difficulty is in bearing the weight of the consequences and the legacy of it. It's hard to say if he had regret or if that convert or if that decision is more difficult now. But I, I think, you know, regardless of what we think about the, about the morality and the consequences, I think... Ultimately, I think the decision for him was an easy one. I think he was motivated by, you know, a few key factors that ultimately would have led him to say yes multiple times over and over again, if given the opportunity. For sure. And I think that duty and then looking at the alternative, if he doesn't take the job, someone else will. And then exactly. if they don't do a good enough job, the war against Japan go lasts another year and 200,000 Americans die on the first day of invading the mainland. There's a there's a lot there. And I think, yeah, from that duty perspective, I think it makes sense. And I also don't think he necessarily knew that this was going to turn into an arms race. I don't think really many people did. I think for him, it was, we'll build this thing and then we're going to realize how destructive it is and no one's going to want to build any more of these things. I think maybe he's more of maybe pushing back on himself a little bit for not recognizing it sooner, but also I think just a lot of disappointment with how the world kind of handled, you know, what they created. So yeah, I think you're right in the sense of it. It was an easy decision for him. I think, yeah, it's just the, the aftermath was a little bit tricky. And I think it's even a, a good decision. You know, it's an easy decision, a good one for him in terms of, you know, he's, if part of it was to do his duty and part of it was to, you know, etch his name in the history books and to really just accomplish something. He did all three and he did it with flying colors. So I think, we have to say it's a good decision. And then I think the last piece being, you know, the legacy, right, of can your legacy be any greater than, you know, you created one of the most, if not the most transformational technology the world may ever see. No, I think it also goes to, you know, like if we're talking about, you know, leadership, decision making and, mm -hmm. and measuring impact, part of decision making is understanding the results of your decision. Mm. Right. And being able to understand the consequences of it. There's always a sacrifice. There's always a give and a take, regardless of what decision you make. And I think to your previous point about him kind of going to the U.S. government saying, you know, we need we need to be disarming. We cannot make a hydrogen bomb. That shows to me that there is some that that is someone who is keenly aware of what he did and understands the consequences and has foresight to say, no, like we need to draw the line, in the sand here. We can't keep doing this. Right. And I think that really to me showcases and is indicative of indicative of someone who, you know, was correct in making the decision, but also understood that there needs to kind of be this, 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 this turning point where you have to be able to say no based on what you've learned based on your previous decision. Yeah. I think that's a great point. It's, I don't even know if we'd call it adapting, but yeah, I think for, foresight is a big one and just understanding the landscape where you're starting to see, okay, if we make a hydrogen bomb, well, what are we going to make after a hydrogen bomb? What are we exactly. going to make after that? And being a physicist and, and talking to all of his colleagues, they know exactly what could be created if people put their minds together and, and figure something out. So yeah, I think I think it does go to show he has that ability to, to understand the, the greater picture. And ultimately, he's willing to put his reputation on the line. Like he knew the risks. He's, yeah. you know, he's seeing what's going on around him. Again, I don't think his, as we've seen his ability to be maybe the most social and be <laughs> able to handle the situations probably didn't do him any favors. And I think there's some, some spats that he gets in after the war with a few different people that definitely didn't help his case, but ultimately he put his neck out on the line for what he believed in. And I think that's always something that we can say a lot of great leaders have. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the way he wanted, but ultimately, if we go back, he did what he needed to do for part one. 
And even for part two, like, you know, we see if we look at the next 20 to 30 years, you know, there's test ban treaties and this nuclear disarmament starting or the, you know, the agreements not to build any new um, nuclear weapons kind of goes back to him and people around him kind of advocating for this stuff. So yeah, maybe didn't get to see it all in his lifetime, but again, had the foresight to, to kind of set the seeds and realize that this needs to change. And, you know, it ultimately did. So I think that's definitely something that we can add to his legacy that maybe I didn't really take into account, you know, just looking at Oppenheimer Manhattan project legacy and then moving on. There's a, there's yeah, a lot more to it. Yep. Awesome. So yeah, I think that's a good place to, to maybe wrap it up. And I don't know, Richie, if you've got any closing thoughts. Decision-making is complicated. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> I think this one was super interesting. You know, we study this in school. We talk about World War II ad nauseum. It is one of my favorite historical things to discuss. You know, we often glaze over the scientific, you know, implications of what was done. It's super interesting learning about Oppenheimer and the role that he played. I think most people kind of stop and end with him being, you know, quote unquote, destroyer of worlds. But I think that is a disservice to his legacy and his contributions and to him as a person. I think hopefully we unpacked a lot about him. And I think, you know, good leaders who make decisions reflect on their decisions. And I think his ability to kind of go back and understand the reverberations of his decision to walk them back later in life. Um, in terms of kind of reaching out to the government and seeing where this was going to go, I think speaks a lot to his character. And I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways for me. And, and I think for most people, if if you know, if you're in the position to make a very complicated decision, you have to be able to adapt and understand, you know, the results of what you did and be able to kind of calculate and make sure you, you know, pivot as required. For sure. And I think yeah, he could have been a glory hunter and went for, I did bomb part one, I could do number two and be hailed a hero. I could do part three and be hailed a hero. But yeah, he definitely pivoted. He understood the situation, reflected on everything that he did and listened to a lot of people around him. And I think he did what he thought was best. And ultimately, it didn't work out for him short term, but long term, it made the world a better place. So that's one heck of a legacy for you. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, tip our hat to Oppenheimer and uh, and thank him for, for at least pushing back on the the thing that he created and, and understanding that the world had changed forever and that he's more than you know just a quote he's he's someone who can see the bigger picture and, and do what's right so kudos to him all right we'll wrap it up there and uh thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time thanks everyone Thank you so much for listening to the History in Motion podcast. We appreciate your support. And if you're a fan of what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time.